Good afternoon, everyone. So in this session, <coughs> I'll be talking about anonymity systems. So for those of you who were at Claudia Diaz's talk, you'll know a bit about the general topic of privacy. But what this is going to be about is one of the primitives for achieving some types of privacy. So privacy is a fairly broad topic. It includes things like data protection, which is saying that people who have your data should only be able to process it in certain ways. Um, it encompasses things like um, electronic payments. Quite frequently, all of these systems will somehow need to be built on top of an anonymous communication system because there's no point in doing fancy crypto in order to protect against someone from monitoring um, what you're spending money on based on some cryptographic properties of the money if you're sending your payment for everything along with your IP address because for most of people your IP address is going to be more or less the same as your identity. You might share it with a few other people. Um, you might um, uh, be, say, behind that, but even in those sorts of cases, based on some combination of data, like, say, browser fingerprint, combined with, for example, um, your IP address, you'll be able to work out who someone is. So you need both clever crypto for doing what you want and some sort of infrastructure for permitting communications when you are doing anonymous, uh, doing things that require privacy-enhancing technology. But the goal of anonymous communication is, roughly speaking, to allow you to communicate without giving away your identity. In practice, this is your IP address, like I mentioned, but in other cases, there are, it could be other low-level identifiers. It could be your MAC address if you're uh, communicating on a local network, but most of the networks I'm going to talk about are designed to run on the internet, so it's your IP address. These are used in their own right if you're, for example, browsing the web and you don't want people to be able to spy on what you're doing. So you don't want the website to be able to see what you're doing and you don't want people who are monitoring your own internet, internet connection to see what you're doing. Um, but, for example, you can also combine it with a private information retrieval system. So here you have a database and the database has got some clever cryptography which means that you can query this database without disclosing what you're looking up. But sometimes you might want to also hide um, um, not only what you're looking up, whether you're using this database at all, and in that case you have to combine it with an uh, anonymous communication system. But the growing use of anonymous communication systems is now censorship resistance. So many, many countries do block content on the internet, and anonymous communication systems is one tool which allow you to um, still access the internet even when you're being censored. The reason that people can do censorship and the reason that people can also implement surveillance is a consequence of the construction of the internet. Privacy wasn't really designed into the internet when it was made. It was enough of an achievement to allow computers with different architectures to communicate in the first place, let alone try to do this privately. So the internet has been optimised in its initial design for connectivity and its current design for reducing cost. When you illustrate the internet, quite frequently it's a cloud and messages go into the cloud, messages come out of the cloud and it doesn't really have any structure, but it does have structure. So in practice, you don't get access directly to the internet, you have access to an internet service provider. Almost certainly what material you're trying to access is not hosted by that internet service provider, so it has to contact another one. Quite frequently, this ISP will be in a different country, and many ISPs do not have international connections. They can only connect to ISPs in the same country, because when you connect to different countries, there's additional cost constraints, 
there's additional political problems and in some countries the ability to connect to ISPs out of the country is a carefully regulated privilege which is only given out under certain circumstances. So while you might have lots and lots of ISPs in the country, there's probably going to be a comparatively small number who actually have international connectivity. And typically those will be the large telcos, and typically large telcos are either government owned or government regulated. And if they're government owned or regulated, they can be forced to do censorship. So if we take a, a concrete example, this is China, uh, the Chinese, a map of the Chinese internet. Um, at the bottom, you have the major ISPs. So these are the people who provide internet to customers. There's lots more who aren't quite as major. But here you have a much smaller number, um, this is actually all of them, of um, the core ISPs. Sometimes these things are called ISPs and these th ones are called internet access providers. Um, these can connect to other ISPs. Um, these can connect to any other ISP in China. Um, whereas these ones can only connect to maybe one or two of the ISPs that they've got some special deal with. Um, these are the same, the people up here are the same up here, and this shows the connectivity between each of these internet service providers, and these three things are internet exchanges. Another misconception about the internet is that it, it was designed to withstand a nuclear strike and therefore it's extremely resilient. Actually, the internet was never designed to withstand a nuclear strike. It was designed by the military, but it was to allow military scientists to communicate. And so it doesn't have the resiliency properties that you would expect if you had a network that was designed to survive a nuclear strike. There are other networks which do that. The internet isn't one of them. And in fact, it tends to be actually fairly concentrated. So in China, which is a massive country, there are only three internet exchanges and almost all internet traffic will go over one of these three internet exchanges. In Europe, there are also three major internet exchanges. There was one in London and one in Amsterdam, which are um, pretty large. Um, there was one in Germany, which is a bit smaller. And almost all European internet traffic will go over at least one of these. And if you manage to take out one of these um, one of these internet exchanges, then you would cause quite devastating damage to the internet. These internet exchanges are fairly resilient themselves. The London one um, is actually built over three buildings. It's got two independent um, networking systems. The one in Amsterdam um, has slightly different architecture, but it's still designed for resiliency. But even if it's designed to withstand accidental damage, or damage due to software bugs, it's not designed to avoid regulation. So down here, you've got a, a dozen or so ISPs. If you lean on them, then you'll manage to um, get censorship or surveillance employed. Uh, if you look at these three internet exchanges, you'll definitely be able to do that. And these dozen or so ISPs are the only ones with international connectivity. So up here is a list of countries that China has direct access to. And so there are 13 CEOs you need to lean on to get what you want. And China has leaned on those CEOs and got what they wanted. They managed to block quite a lot of content. We wanted to establish exactly what sort of things that they were blocking in China. Um, we were also interested as part of the OpenNet initiative, which was a research project I was involved in, we were interested in what other countries were doing. So we did a survey in 2006 of 40 countries. There's been subsequent studies of larger um, sets of countries. Broadly speaking, they have the same results. And they found that a lot of content was blocking, a lot of, a lot of content was being blocked, a lot of countries were doing blocking, and sometimes the content was surprising. Um, but it also varied dramatically between countries. The major target in China was websites discussing human rights, things that we would call human rights. So this is human rights in China, talking about people being imprisoned without um, due cause, talking about lack of democracy. So that website is blocked in China. In general, websites which are critical 
of the Chinese government um, are quite likely to be blocked. But if you move over to some other countries, um, particularly in the Middle East, religion seems to be the main topic. So um, this website is an example of a website which is very, very heavily blocked. And this is because it not only criticizes Islam, but it is deliberately trying to convert people from Islam to Christianity, which is a capital offense in many of these countries. If you do that, you can be put to death. And for understandable reasons, these sorts of websites are blocked. Um, but by far the widest category of material that's being blocked is pornography. So of the countries that we looked at, almost all of them either said that they intended to block pornography or they did block pornography. Sometimes they said they um, intended to do it but actually didn't. One of the more interesting cases was Vietnam and Vietnam's government is a bit interesting in its structure but they don't like criticism. They introduced the internet censorship system and they said that this was solely for blocking pornography. When we tested, we couldn't find any pornographic website which was blocked. The only websites were blocked were um, websites which were critical of the government. So that's a very clear case. Yeah, do you have a question? Uh, what is the methodology you used to see if it goes through? Yeah, people in the country or? Yes, we send people to the country, get them to get a few internet connections and then do that. Um, I've, this is quite an interesting topic. It's very challenging to monitor internet censorship. Um, the other thing that we did is, within the country, we simultaneously request our website from via the country and then also via Canada. So if the website happens to be down that day, then hopefully we will not trigger that as being a censorship event. Um, in, I think, May, I think May this year, May, June this year, there is a magazine coming out, Internet Computing Magazine. I'm a guest editor of that. And that has an article from Ron Debert. Um, and that talks about the methodology for monitoring internet censorship. Um, we're having a bit of a fight with the IEEE, who are the publishers. They want to make it closed access. We want to make it open access. So we're also going to publish the full text of all the material on the Harvard and Cambridge websites. So you'll be able to get access to it even if you don't subscribe to IEEE. Okay. Yeah, so do feel free to ask questions if, if you have any. Yeah, and this pattern of countries blocking content, um, well, introducing a blocking system for blocking one type of content and then extending it for blocking other types of content is very familiar. Um, there is something called the slippery, slippery slope fallacy, where you say that um, this introducing censorship is one step along the lines of censoring other things. But although it's a fallacy in general, in the case of internet censorship, this seems to be the case. Um, it's even happened in the UK, where there was a very limited blocking system introduced for blocking images of child abuse. There was only about 100 websites or so which were on this block list, but now, now this block list is rapidly growing because the movie industry and the music industry are putting on websites um, which distribute copyrighted content without authorization. So the Pirate Bay was the latest one to go on this list. There's a court case going on at the moment, although nobody is contesting the case to add a few more websites to this list. Um, probably the next set of websites to go on this list are websites which are containing libelous information or alleged libelous information. So those are the three main categories, human rights, religion and pornography, but there's all sorts of other ones. So military and militant websites end up there. Um, sex education quite often gets lumped with pornography, either deliberately or accidentally. Um, alcohol and drugs, particularly in the Middle East, um, but also when the censorship systems are targeted towards schools and children. Um, gay and lesbian websites 
um, also quite frequently gets misclassified as being pornographic. And then also news websites. Um, China goes from blocking BBC News to not blocking BBC News, um, depending on different forces within the country. Um, in China, the government does not have absolute control, and if they block too much, people will get unhappy. So they're continually trying to walk the fine line of blocking enough that they maintain their control and not blocking too much that people start um, uprising against them. In all of these cases, I've been talking about blocking with technology. So you go onto your computer, you try to access the website, and it's not there. Um, or you can't access the web page, you see an error message, or, or so on. This requires software, and this software is generally produced by a company outside of the country. The only major case, which is an exception, is China. China have more than enough qualified software engineers to produce blocking systems. China also has different problems from most countries. Um, for one, they're far, far larger. They're the largest number of internet users. The, the country with the largest number of internet users has now well exceeded the US. But for most other countries, what they tend to use is a blocking system which was built for stopping American companies, employees, looking at silly websites during work and then scaling that up a little bit and then deploying that in the country. The hard part is not so much producing the blocking software, but producing the blocking list and continually updating this blocking list of which websites um, belong in which category. And then the country can then choose which of these categories that they wish to block. And they can also, of course, add any things that are custom onto this list of categories. To illustrate how these blocking systems work, I'm going to, first of all, give a very simplified idea of how the internet works. So on this side, you've got the user who wants to access a web page, um, example.org slash page.html. The first thing that the user's web browser will do is it has to find out the IP address that corresponds to this website, example.org. So he will contact the DNS server, which is run by his ISP that's been configured. That domain name system server will go across the internet and contact the DNS server, which is authoritative for this um, domain name. Typically, this will be run by um, the website owner's ISP, um, if they're a small website, or the website owner themselves, if they're a large website. The answer comes back over the internet, back to the user's web browser, and now the web browser knows that example.org corresponds to the IP address, say, 192.0.2.166. Now the web browser can go off and make a connection to the web server, and the first thing that he sends us to is a router in his ISP. There may be a few in his home, maybe a few bit later, but at some point it will go through a big router in the ISP. That router will decide the best way of getting it to the web server, so it will send it through other ISPs, send it through internet exchanges. Eventually, that message will get to the web server, and that message will say, please give me page.html. The response will come back via the router to the user, and then that web page can be displayed. This game then gets repeated for images and CSS, but roughly speaking, that's how it works. The first type of internet censorship technology that I'm going to talk about is DNS tampering. So here, when the user tries to find out the IP address corresponding to example.org, he'll get a response saying, this page doesn't exist. Or maybe he'll be sent the wrong answer. This was the censorship system that was introduced in Germany for blocking a neo-Nazi website called Stormfront. And in some ways, it's useful to do this because it's relatively cheap. Uh, the router processes massive amounts of data, whereas DNS servers process a much smaller amount of data and much less frequently. So typically, they're smaller. And getting it to look up a list of banned words is relatively easy, but it does have some major disadvantages. One is that when this request is being made, 
it's not clear what the user's web browser is going to do about it. So maybe the user is going to send an email, maybe the user is going to send a, start a chat, um, maybe the user is going to access a page which has got entirely innocent information. The DNS server doesn't know anything about this, and so the DNS server is going to block this website regardless of whether the content that's going to be requested is actually illegal. This is an example of overblocking, and this is a reason that um, it was judged unconstitutional for Germany to do this type of blocking. So a better way of doing blocking in some respects um, is IP address blocking. So here the request come, goes out, the request comes back, the user's web browser gets the correct IP address, but now the user tries to connect to this IP address, it goes to the router, and the router just drops the request on the floor. Routers are perfectly capable of doing that. All you have to do is tell a router that the best way of getting to this IP address is to drop the packet on the floor. And what routers have at their heart is a big list of how to get, how, what's the best way of getting to each IP address. And you just add one extra rule that says delete this, or maybe you send a rule to say um, don't send it over to the right ISP, send it over to this web server, which will send back a message to say that the website's being blocked. This is what an ISP in Pakistan tried to do for YouTube because there were some objectionable videos being posted on YouTube. But they made a bit of a mistake. Not only did these new routes that were added to their router um, block their own users, they started getting propagated out to the rest of the internet. The way the internet routing system works is an ISP says, how can you get to my, um, my computers? You can send it via this person or you can send it via that person and this gets distributed. Um, what this ISP ended up doing is saying that I am YouTube. If you want to send any information to YouTube, then send it to me. This is a tiny ISP. YouTube's one of the biggest websites on the internet. So the ISP dropped off the internet um, YouTube were able to quite fairly quickly recover from this, um, but that ISP got in quite a lot of problems. So there's quite a few trade-offs going on here. With DNS blocking, it's quite, quite easy and cheap to implement, but it overblocks and it's also trivial to bypass. In order to block, uh, bypass DNS blocking, all you have to do is reconfigure your DNS server so that rather than using your own DNS server, you use someone else's. Um, an easy one to remember is um, to use Google's one because their IP address is just 8.8.8.8 and then you'll bypass DNS blocking. IP blocking is a bit harder to bypass. It's still fairly easy and cheap to implement uh, because routers already have the ability to send request destined to particular IP addresses and sometimes to port um, to particular destinations. But it also overblocks for virtual hosting. If you choose to host a website somewhere cheap, then almost certain it will be hosted on the same web server as hundreds or maybe thousands of other websites. It will be sharing the same hardware and sharing the same IP address. And if you block one website using IP address blocking, you block all other websites that are sharing the same website, uh, sharing the same IP address. So a way of trying to mitigate this overblocking is proxy blocking. So you have a proxy server. It looks at the request coming in. It reads all the, the content. Um, so it looks at all the headers. It knows which web page you're going to. Um, it even can look, if it sees the message coming back, at the content of the web page and then decide whether this should be sent on to the user. This is very expensive because now this proxy has to process a lot of data. It has to see all the requests coming in, all the requests going out, parse this, work out whether it's good or not. But it does have a low level of overblocking. There's a hybrid approach which is used by BT in the UK called CleanFeed. More ISPs are now adopting this where you combine the advantages of IP blocking and proxy blocking to get something that's cheaper but should not overblock to the same extent. The way this works is when you want to go to a website, 
first of all, it's checked whether there are any web pages on this IP address which are blocked. If there are no web pages on that IP address that are blocked, your request goes straight through. If it is, the IP blocking kicks in, but rather than blocking it, it sends that request to our proxy server. The proxy can then do more fine grain <coughs> testing and check whether the website should be accessible. Um, if it is, it will prox it proxy the request, and if it's decided to be blocked, then it will send back some sort of block page. So this seems to get the advantages of both of these options, but also has some serious problems. One of which is that this IP hybrid IP address blocking system has to have a proxy, and that proxy has to be told which IP addresses it should proxy and which should be sent through directly. And the way that it does this is the same way a web browser does this. It does an IP address lookup uh, based on the domain name. And these domain names are of websites which are hosting illegal content, so there's a good chance that these DNS servers are run by criminals too. So what these DNS servers can, can do is that when they detect that it's the blocking system making a request, they give the wrong IP address. But when they detect a user is making a request, they give the correct IP address. And now the IP address blocking will not work because it has the wrong sets of IP addresses. Another thing it could do is rather than sending back the wrong IP address, it could send back, say, the BBC News IP address or YouTube IP address. That wouldn't block YouTube or the BBC News, but it would cause all BBC News traffic and all, um, BB and all YouTube traffic to go through this proxy server. And that proxy server was designed to handle a few dozen requests a second, not a few tens of thousands. So it will almost certainly fail. And secondly, you can also extract information. What you can watch is when you make a request to a web page, when does that request come back? Does it come back um, from a computer very close to you or from one very far away from you? And Richard Clayton, Cambridge, did an experiment and he tried to access all web pages at all websites in Russia and saw when they came back. Most of the time it came back from a computer a dozen or so hops away. That was probably the computer in Russia. And occasionally it would come back from one hop away. That was the proxy server. So he now knows that at this website's IP address, someone is hosting illegal images of children. Now, of course, he's got no interest in looking for that sort of material. But if you are looking for that sort of material, then this gives you a list of guaranteed illegal child porn images. And this is exactly what this blocking system was trying to prevent. So those were examples of ways of blocking websites through technology. But let's suppose that those aren't being used for one reason or another, or they aren't considered to be sufficient. You can also try preventing people from accessing a website by telling them that this website doesn't exist. And this was a, an approach that was tried in China. Um, it's tried in some other countries too. Um, Google and China are now an interesting case where Google have actually moved out of China, moved to Hong Kong. But while they were still in China, this was the sort of website you would get if you tried to look up Tiananmen Square. On the left-hand side is what happens if you look at it from the UK, and you see the iconic image of um, someone facing down a tank in Tiananmen Square. On the right-hand side, you do the same search in China, and then you'll see people decorating Tiananmen Square for the Olympic Games. So even if you can find out from websites what's going on, if the search engines aren't telling you that these websites exist, then you're in a much harder position. And typically, this approach of censoring search engine results is combined with technological blocking, and they each make up for the deficiencies of each other. So all these censorship systems have quite serious limitations, whether they're blocking to, through technology or whether they're blocking um, content on search engines. They will block legitimate content and they'll also fail to block um, banned content. So the terms normally used for this is um, overblocking or false positive, 
for blocking legitimate content and false negatives or under blocking for um, failing to block banned content. And there's also many ways that these can be circumvented. So for DNS blocking, you can change your, um, change your DNS server. For um, IP address blocking, you can use proxy servers and so on. And people do have the ability to bypass these blocking systems with only a little bit of extra research. These systems are also very expensive to build or buy. More, more often than not, they're bought. And this can be a significant proportion of the cost of setting up internet infrastructure in a country. And then there are the social issues, like when you try to block one bit of content, there's a pressure to start blocking other bits of content. And also, it's nowhere near as transparent as it should be. Quite frequently, countries will not disclose what sort of websites they block, and sometimes they'll even actively go out of their way to disclose what they've blocked. One case was in Tunisia, before the Arab Spring. They were having um, a conference on how to run the internet, and people were trying to access websites from inside Tunisia. When they try to access certain websites, they would see an Internet Explorer um, error page um, saying 404, this web page not found. They were seeing this error page even when they were using Firefox. What was happening is that there was a proxy blocking system in place, and in order to disguise the fact that they were doing proxy blocking, it would send back an instant error message, but they obviously didn't do that very correctly. So if you cannot use technology to fully achieve your goals, then what you can do is block material through laws, fear, and intimidation. The first way that this can be used, I've mentioned already, you can force ISPs to block websites, or more likely, you will threaten them um, into self-regulation. This is a very common approach of governments. What they will do is say um, to an ISP or any sort of technology company, they will say that, I'm slightly paraphrasing here, we are incompetent when it comes to writing laws, when it comes to technology. Um, the people who are um, actually going to implementing the law probably get their email printed out. The people who are enforcing the law, like judges, um, probably don't know how to use a mouse. And ISPs know that governments are incompetent about writing laws, and the governments know this. And they will tell the ISPs that wouldn't it be better if you implemented self-regulation rather than risk us writing a terrible law. So the ISPs do self-regulation. And that was how the censorship system in the UK was introduced. The ISPs were all told, do something or we will write a bad law. It will be really terrible and we won't really know what to do. The other way that you can intimidate organisations is through fear of detection and retribution. So you can tell them, don't test the rules because if you do test the rules, if you do try to access these websites, then something bad will happen to you. Sometimes um, these will be through laws or sometimes it will be social pressure or extra legal punishment, a, a euphemism for beating people up on the street. These examples are quite often seen in the Middle East. Um, the person I've got down here um, is an Egyptian blogger. I hope he's out of jail now, but uh, he was put in jail um, for blogging material <coughs> that was critical of the authorities um, back then. There's also cases of people being tortured in car parks because they've posted material um, that is critical of governments. Um, that was in um, Uzbekistan. And here's a, a little cute cartoon character. This is from a website in China. She's dressed up as a, a policewoman. Um, there, there's a pair of them. There's Jing Jing and Cha Cha, um, one male, one female police officer. And these pop up on various Chinese portal websites and they're stated explicitly as being there so that they remind you that you are being watched and the internet is not a lawless place. And what's more, if you click on them, then they'll put you in an instant messenger chat to a policeman or a policewoman, and then you can report on people um, or actions that you think the police should investigate. 
People don't know whether they're under surveillance. They're probably not. There's too many people in China to actually watch. But they know that there's a risk of them being watched and they know that the potential um, benefit, the potential harm that will happen to them if they're caught doing something um, will be quite large. And so that is a very strong encouragement for them not to step out of line. The, this approach of intimidation starts getting combined with other approaches like technical measures because the technical measures tell people that the government is in control of the internet, this is the sort of content that we don't want you looking at and then the laws fear and intimidation is used to stop people trying to test those boundaries or find ways to bypass the censorship. This leads on to one of the re important requirements of a censorship resistance system. So the obvious one is that the website should allow you to visit the web, the, the service should allow you to visit the website that you want to. But the additional requirement is it should also hide who the user is when they access this website. Because the first one actually allows you to get, get the content, the second one is to avoid the retribution that might come if you access the website. And what's more, these properties should be maintained even if the system is partially compromised because maybe the government will hack into the anonymity system, maybe the government will start running part of the anonymity system. These properties might slightly decay if the website, if the anonymity system is compromised, but they shouldn't be completely destroyed. It's not just people who want to buy, bypass censorship who need these sorts of properties. It's also just ordinary people who don't want their information being sold to marketers. So if you do some Google searches for one thing, then you might find out uh, what Google know about you. They start selling you um, other sorts of products that are related or maybe from the same manufacturer. Um, also, militaries and law enforcement they need these sorts of properties when they're doing surveillance. So suppose law enforcement are accessing a website that's known to be run by the mafia. They don't want police.uk show up in the web logs of this mafia website because maybe the mafia website will start sending malware back to um, the police or maybe they'll send completely, honest, uh, completely innocent pages and prevent the law enforcement from actually doing their intelligence gathering. Militaries have similar goals. Um, also, anonymous tip lines are needed quite frequently because, as most law enforcement people will know, not all law enforcement people are honest. Some work for the criminals. And just because you have an anonymous tip line, which only the police have access to the identity of people who are sending tips, doesn't actually prevent the people who are sending tips. And the people who are sending in tips know this, and they won't use an anonymous tip line if they're worried that corrupt policemen could out their identity to the criminal organisations that they're dealing with. Uh, journalists want to protect whistleblowers for very similar reasons. Um, even if a, a journalist is going to be very insistent about protecting their own source, they first of all could be compelled um, either by threats or by law to hand over the identity of their source and also their computer could be hacked into and then disclose the, any information about the source. So they might want to avoid having information about where information is coming from in order to protect their sources. Human rights workers might want to bypass censorship but they might also want to protect themselves from surveillance when they're, say, blogging about something. Um, they might be working, not exactly undercover, but they might not want to disclose their identity, um, and they certainly won't want to disclose the people that they're talking to. And also businesses use these anonymous communication systems um, because they want to um, observe their competition. If they are want to take over another company, they might want to find out a little bit of, about this company during due diligence, but they don't want to tell that company that they're considering buying them over. And also for building anonymous collaborations. One project I worked on was a group of 
um, large companies who are being hacked fairly often, or at least being attacked fairly often, wanted to disclose information about what types of attacks they were seeing in order to help their um, co companies in a similar position to them from defending themselves. These companies were all competitors, but they realised that it was for the common good that they could share information about attacks they were seeing, but also they didn't want to disclose to their competitors that this company was being attacked, especially if those attacks were being at least partially successful. So they used an anonymous communication system, um, along with other anonymizing techniques, to share information about attacks, yet protect their identity. And that worked out well for everyone involved. So that's why you might want an anonymous communication system, but how do you actually build it? The first way that anonymous communication systems differ from, um, say, cryptographic protection systems is that you cannot have anonymity by yourself. If you want to send an encrypted email to someone, then you choose one of however many billion, billion keys, you encrypt your message under that key, and then you send it to the other party. Anyone who's eavesdropping cannot see what your message is. You can't get anonymous communication system up to the same level of security because there aren't billions and billions um, of users of anonymous communication system. There's only a few billion people in the world and you can only hide yourself amongst a crowd of other people. And what's more, you can only hide amongst a crowd of other un anonymous people. So you want to build an anonymity system that is attractive to get as many people using this system so you have a larger crowd to hide in. And this is summed up by the catchphrase that anonymity loves company. This is why anonymity systems like Tor, which were originally developed by the US military, were open to the world. It's not because the US military, um, as a policy, want the world to have anonymity. Some people who work for the military might think so. Some people might not. But they know that in order for the military to have anonymity, they need to have everyone having the right to anonymity. There's no point in having the military anonymity system because then immediately anyone who uses this stands out as being working for the military. It's got to be shared by human rights workers. Um, it's got to be um, shared with law enforcement. And in the case of law enforcement, it's got to be shared with criminals. The law enforcement rely on the fact that criminals are using the same system in order for law enforcement to have any privacy. If it was only good people who were using anonymity systems, then websites which are hosting criminal content would not allow access to their websites from anonymity systems. But there are a few criminals who are using these systems, and so law enforcement actually get the properties that they want. So here's an, an example of an anonymous communication system. This is about the, the simplest you can come up with. This is called a mix. It was originally envisaged by David Chaum. And here you've got a computer. And what this computer does is it's got a, a private key. Um, it, this is, well, in the case of the original mix was RSA, but it doesn't really matter. And what the two people do, um, we're calling them Alice, Bob, Charlie and Dave. So Alice wants to communicate to Dave. Bob wants to communicate with Charlie. So Alice takes her message and then she sticks on top of the message for D, so for Dave, and then encrypts this whole bundle under the mix's public key. Um, B does a similar thing, takes the, the message, puts for Charlie on top of it, encrypts the whole thing under the mix's public key. Sends these to the mix. The mix has the corresponding private key, can decrypt these, work out who the message is going to be sent to, and then sends it on. So you can see what's going on because you can see what's in the message, but if you don't have the public key, sorry, if you don't have the private key, you'll see two messages coming in, which you can't understand, and two messages going out, which you can understand, but you won't be able to work out whether A is communicating with C or D, or whether B is communicating C or D, because the address of the further destination is part of this encrypted content. So this protects against eavesdroppers relatively well, but it doesn't protect against the mix being evil, because the mix can trivially see that this message coming in 
corresponds to this message going out, and this message coming in corresponds to that going message going out. And this violates the property that we described earlier, which is that even if the system is partially compromised, you, we should still maintain the security properties. The solution to this is something called a remailer. And here, rather than having one mix, you have several mixes. So here, oops, um, A wants to communicate to C, and B wants to communicate to D. What A does is, first of all, takes the message, does the same as before, puts 4C, and now encrypts it under the public key of mix number 3. And then, that was all before, but it does something new here, it puts mix number 3's address up here, and then encrypts it all under the public key of mix number 1. Bob does something similar, puts on D's address, encrypts it under public key 2, puts on mix 2's address, and puts on, uh, encrypts it under the public key of, uh, of mix 3. So let's look at A first of all. So A encrypts it under the public key of mix 1, so sends it to mix 1. Mix 1 now decrypts this, and what it gets is a message that says um, for mix 3, and then some content that it can't, uh, it, um, sorry, what mix 1 sees uh, coming out is um, that it was for mix 3, but it cannot see this um, content because this is un encrypted under mix 3's public key. S but mix 1 can pass it on to mix 3, and mix 3 can then decrypt it, know it should be sent on to C. So what mix 1 sees is a message that's coming from A and is going to mix 3, but it doesn't see C's address. What mix 3 sees is something that's coming from mix 1, is going to C, but it doesn't see A's address. So mix 1 knows where something is coming from, mix 3 knows where something is going, but unless they're working together, they shouldn't be able to discover um, who is actually communicating with whom. And this gives the property called unlinkability, which is what we're looking for. But there is a problem with this sort of system. Um, suppose you've got this mix, and then you see a message coming in here, then a message um, going out there, then a message coming in here, and then a message going out there. It knows, with, someone who's observing this knows with certainty that this input corresponds to that out, in, output, and that input corresponds to that output. It can't see the content, but based on the correlation between timing, it knows who's communicating with who. So this is really bad. The problem also exists here. So if this message comes in here and goes out there, then this message comes in here and goes out there. Someone observing it completely breaks the security of the system. So what we have to do is somehow hide timing patterns. A simple way to do this is called the threshold mix. And here, the mix receives a number of messages, and when it hits a particular batch size, then it sends out all of the messages in a random order. So here we've got a mix. The batch size is five. In practice, it's larger, but this is good for an example. First message comes in, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, and then all the messages come out in a random order. There are still problems with this. That's why we're modern anonymity systems use more complicated batching strategy. Threshold mix is an example of a batching strategy. But this is good for an example of a way of hiding traffic patterns. But what you can see is that this introduces significant delay. So if these messages, these five messages, came in over a period of a day, then the first message that came in is going to be delayed by a day when it actually comes out. And that's why these sorts of mix systems are used really only for email, where a day of latency is tolerable, although not desirable, um, but they're not used for web browsing, where a day of latency would make the system completely break. But even though these systems introduce a lot of inconvenience, it doesn't mean that they hide all information. You can still do traffic analysis. So traffic analysis is the science of looking at 
information on traffic data. Traffic data is everything apart from the content. So this is information about when messages were sent, when they were received, um, who is the visible sender of messages, who is the visible destination, how large are they, how often are messages sent. This is really the backbone of intelligence. Um, in places like Bletchley Park, they are very well known for breaking Enigma and the other ciphers that were used in World War II. But that was a comparatively small amount of their job. What they mainly did was do traffic analysis. They didn't have to decrypt the messages in order to work out quite a lot of information about military operations. And what they could also do is by looking at traffic analysis, traffic data, they were able to work out which were the messages that they should spend their time decrypting. They were never going to be able to decrypt all of the messages, but maybe they could ensure that they were able to decrypt the important ones. And traffic analysis was and still is the technique used for deciding where to target more advanced surveillance techniques. In the th case of the threshold mix, one easy bit of traffic analysis to do is just count who's receiving messages. You can see which proportion of the total messages that are being sent out over several rounds are being received by each person. And this person we see is receiving 9% of messages, and maybe this person is there for interesting. Maybe they're the ringleader. Maybe they're doing something quite interesting. You can also spot patterns over time. So maybe um, this person who receives a tiny proportion of messages today starts receiving many, many more messages tomorrow. Maybe that's something interesting. Um, a cute example was in the run-up to the Iraq war, the number of pizzas being ordered by the Department of Defence jumped dramatically. And through that, they were able to work out what was going on. You can actually do even better than this sort of traffic analysis, and that you can actually work out who's communicating with whom. So here, in each round, so each set of messages that come in and set of messages that go out, you know who is sending. You don't know exactly who is sending to whom, but you do know that um, these, say, five people sending messages in are co corresponding with these five people going out. Suppose you're interested in one person, let's call her Alice, and she is sending in a certain proportion of rounds. You split the output round, the output sets of people who are receiving messages into two categories. There's the people who receive messages in rounds when Alice was sending, and the people who receive message when in the rounds when Alice was not sending. So when Alice is not sending, these are the recipients of messages, and when Alice is sending, these are the recipients of messages. And you look for the difference between these two columns. And there are some people who are interesting. So this person who normally only receives 1% of messages suddenly gets 20% of messages when Alice is sending. Probably this person is um, one of Alice's communication partners. Um, this is an attack called the statistical disclosure attack. Um, it works even on the more advanced matching strategies. It doesn't always give you the exact answer, but it does give you a priority list of who to investigate next. Because of the very large amount of latency that those sorts of batching strategies introduced, those are only used for email. They're not used for web traffic. But web traffic does have the advantage that there's much, much more of it. This makes it, in some ways, more desirable to try to hide your content in web traffic. And also, so many more people want to use web than email. That's why most of the research nowadays on anonymity systems is on hiding web traffic. But this is a fundamentally more difficult challenge. The two things that anonymity systems, um, email anonymity systems want to hide is timing correlation, like I mentioned. They also want to hide correlation based on message size. So if you see a tiny message coming in, and then a big message coming in, and then a tiny one coming out, and a big one coming out, you know that the tiny corresponds to tiny, and large corresponds to large. And therefore, these systems, in addition to introducing delay, they introduce um, padding. 
So you send the message in and it's padded to a fixed size. You are not allowed to send anything more than that fixed size and if you send any less, then it just gets padded to the same size. That works fine for email, but it works terribly badly for web traffic because you have to pad everything to the same size and in web traffic, you're sometimes downloading a tiny CSS file and sometimes you're downloading a gigabit ISO image. And the way that you'd actually get security is by padding each individual CSS file to one gigabyte in order so you can't work out whether you're downloading an ISO or whether you're downloading a CSS file. And that would be completely intolerable. So we can introduce a little bit of delay, but not very much. And we can introduce a little bit of padding, but not very much. But we still want to maintain some security. And that's what systems like Tor try to achieve. So Tor is originally developed from the Onion Routing Project out of the US military. Um, it now is run by um, the Tor Project, um, who I worked for up till quite recently. And it can route any TCP traffic over it. In practice, however, it's generally used for web browsing. Initially, it was introduced only to avoid um, people being surveilled. So it was developed um, in the US by US people, and at the time, the US didn't have any censorship. Actually, it's one of the few countries that still doesn't have any technical censorship. Um, but now most of the users are not people in America who are trying to avoid um, being surveilled. There are people who are elsewhere in the world who are trying to resist censorship. In some ways it's peer-to-peer -peer in that the nodes which make up the Tor network are run by volunteers, but it also has a centralised directory which publishes a list of all the servers. So every client knows who all the servers are. Here's an <laughs> illustration of the Tor network. Um, there are around about three and a half thousand Tor nodes now. So the client chooses three of these and we call these the entry node, the exit node and the middle node. So the entry node you connect to first, you then do a cryptographic handshake. Um, we use ephemeral Diffie-Hellman in Tor um, and then you now share a key between the entry node and the user and the user then encrypts their content and then connects to a second Tor node, does a Diffie-Hellman handshake, and then shares a key between this and that, and then extends again to the exit node, does another handshake, and now shares a key between the user and this Tor node. And the Tor node then can be requested to go out to a web server and make a request, and the response comes back. These links are all encrypted, but this final link is not encrypted. It cannot be encrypted because you can only encrypt when the two communication partners know how to do encryption. The Tor user certainly will, but this web server may not. Maybe it's an HTTP only web server. So this link, unless there's HTTPS uh, enabled on that web server, will be unencrypted. And that's one of the features that is commonly forgotten of um, when people use Tor, it doesn't magically encrypt the whole internet. If the web server only talks plain text, then the web server still only talks plain text. So I mentioned that there's these two types of encryption going on. The first one is this ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. So here, the user sends um, G to the X to the entry node, the entry node sends G to the Y back to the user. Um, they hammer these together, they end up with the same number and they can now derive a key for encrypting the data and this key is used for AES in counter mode. The reason that we're using ephemeral Diffie-Hellman is for a property called perfect forward secrecy. There's always a risk that these nodes will be compromised um, and if they're compromised all future traffic will be compromised as well. They, can, they know the key, they can decrypt it. But what we would like to happen is that even if they're compromised, they won't be able to decrypt traffic that was sent previously. And this is what ephemeral Diffie-Hellman gives us because the 
key that is shared is known by these two parties. It's stored for the duration of the communication, but then it is thrown away. And also anyone who's eavesdropping the traffic is not able to uh, work out what the key is because the thing that's sent in over here is g to the x, the thing that's sent over there is g to the y, and by themselves, g to the x and g to the y are not enough to extract the key, even if you later on break into these entry and exit nodes. Ephemeral Diffie Hellman by itself is not enough to protect against man in the middle attacks, so there are long term keys used, but these are only signature keys. So the, um, in the case of the entry node, when it sends G to the Y back, that is signed under its RSA key, so it means someone sitting in between cannot impersonate the entry node, but even if the signature key is broken, it doesn't compromise anything in the past. Um, however, this does depend on good random number generators, and you'll have heard from the previous talk, quite frequently people screw up when it comes to good random number generators, and in particular, um, a lot of Tor nodes um, seem to run on Debian, and Debian completely disabled their OpenSSL random number generator. And if your random number generator breaks, then you lose perfect forward secrecy, along with any other properties that you might have. And so that was quite a serious problem. So this disguises the content of the communication, and it also disguises the source, because while this entry node sees the user, the middle node doesn't communicate with the user, it communicates with the entry node, and the exit node doesn't even know who the entry node is, because the exit node shares the key with the user, doesn't share a key with the entry node. And this is the sort of pattern that you get, and this is called telescoping onion routing, because this looks vaguely like a telescope. One of the consequences of using counter mode by itself without using authentication is that there is no increase in packet size um, as messages are sent through. And this is desirable because if someone were able to look at the message and then know where, um, know how much padding, or how many hops it had been through, um, because it got increased in size at each hop, which is normally what happens, then it would, first of all, make a maximum path length in Tor, and secondly, it would mean that you could work out where, at least how many hops something was away. And so there's no authentication using this type of encryption. So Tor uses a second type of encryption, which is TLS, and rather than being end-to-end, -end, this is hop by hop, this does do authentication, and it means that someone tampering with communication on here won't be able to tamper with data that's being sent over there. Also, there can be multiple circuits. This is one circuit. There can be multiple circuits between each entry node and each middle node, um, each middle node and each exit node. These all shame, share the same TLS connection. And this, as a consequence, means that someone who's looking at a, a particular communication cannot work out which circuit a particular packet belongs to, and that gives um, some other nice security properties. However, this does not hide traffic patterns. So if you look at the number of bytes per second or bytes per millisecond over time of data between the user and entry node, you'll see a very similar pattern at each of these points. So if you can monitor enough of the network, you can use traffic analysis to correlate input and output traffic. And this, unfortunately, seems to be inevitable when you build a system which neither introduces significant latency and does not introduce any significant padding. The way to the Tor network tries to deal with this is rather than doing padding or latency, it tries to add diversity to the network. If you can monitor the entire network, you win. So we spread out the network as wide as possible to make it very difficult and very expensive to monitor a significant proportion of the network. And if you cannot monitor, then you can't use traffic analysis. So I mentioned two different systems here. One is something like Tor, where um, 
it doesn't really use latency, padding, um, or dropping messages, or you can actually use some combination of these. I mentioned about adding latency and padding. Um, dropping messages is another possibility. Um, so if you, even if a message, even if a particular packet comes in and it has a particular correlation, you can then send it to the destination, drop a few packets, and then still send the message going on. This reduces the correlation. Obviously, you've lost some data, but if you introduce some error correction beforehand, you can still deal with that. But even if you do all of these things to the maximum level possible, you're still not going to be able to defend against an adversary who infiltrates the network. If all the people between you and where you're communicating with are evil, then there's nothing that cryptography can do to protect you. So in addition to all these mechanisms, there has to be some way of trying to prevent people from infiltrating the network, or at least try, people, try to stop people from um, infiltrating enough of the network to make it worth their while. The way that Tor does this is when you're sending traffic, it will try not to send your traffic to the same person twice. So it won't send it through the same network, where network is defined as a slash 16 twice, and it will try not to send it um, through two nodes which are run by the same people, but there it does rely on the person running the node to say um, whether or not they're running the same nodes. Email systems like Mixmaster and Mixminion do use um, things like um, delays, they use padding, they don't use dropping, um, but these are comparatively minor when it comes to the number of users. And even though they use extra security features, because of the dramatically smaller number of users, this probably means they don't get the same level of security. Um, you can see one example of this um, when it was, there was an anonymous email which was sent um, to a school. The school thought it was one of their pupils, so they simply looked at all the users of anonymous communication systems in the school. There were two of them, so they knocked on their door, pressured them until they confessed. And there, the crypto didn't fail, but because there were so few users, it became quite easy to pressure people into disclosing who, who was doing what. So maybe at first glance, Tor is less secure because you can still do this traffic analysis, but because it has a dramatically larger number of users, I'd say it's probably more secure. So if you're building any sort of system related to this, you need to consider usability. It's not enough to add enough security features because if you add too many of these security features that annoy users, they won't use your system and you won't get security anyway. Another option that you have when building a system is what sort of um, topology to build this network. So topology is, um, in the case of graphs, which I'm using to illustrate here, are which nodes, so each of um, these things, are connected to which other nodes over edges. There are two, proper two main ones which are used for anonymity systems today. Um, one is free route, where everyone is connected to everyone else, and the other one is cascade, where um, there are a number of nodes, but there are only fixed routes between these nodes. So you come into the network here, you go into this node there, you go into that node there. If you come into this one, you have to go to that one and that one. With free route, you have entirely free choice about where you enter the network and where you go on to the next hop in the network. Free route is, roughly speaking, what's used by Tor. Cascade is what's used by another anonymity system that was developed in Dresden University, um, Technical University of Dresden, um, called initially Anon, um, and also sometimes called um, YAP, the Java Anonymizing Proxy. In addition to these two which are actually used, you can come up with um, another few alternatives. So stratified is where if you're entering a network, you have to choose one of these four but then you can choose any one of these four again and any one of these four again. So you're restricted more than free route, but less than cascade. Another option is stratified restricted, where you come in, um, 
you choose your entry node, you choose your exit node, and then your middle node is chosen by you. These all have various different influences when it comes to performance, security, and scalability. So, roughly speaking, the more nodes you have, the lower the performance is going to be because, sorry, the more edges you have, the lower the performance is going to be because there's a certain amount of overhead that comes with setting up and maintaining one of these edges. So in that sense, Cascade is um, most efficient. That was why one of the reasons it was designed the way it does. Um, also, scalability. So with free root, the number of edges scales um, with n squared, where n is the number of nodes, um, whereas Cascade, I think, is, is, is only linear. Um, that's why Tor is fine as working as a peer-to-peer -peer system um, when it's got a few thousand nodes. If it had a few million, it would need to move to a different topology. Um, also, security has um, some influence by the topology, but here the relationship is a bit more complex. And what it turned out to be is that the networks which had the most traffic going through um, a particular edge were the most secure. So here you've got so many edges that there's actually very little traffic going through each edge. On here, you do have quite a lot of traffic, but once you see a particular edge, you know where that message came from, so it doesn't give you very much security. But on stratified and stratified restricted, there's this um, beneficial trade-off. There's a lot of traffic on each of these edges because there aren't as many of them as free route. But when you see something on this edge, it could have come from um, any one of these four edges. And so it turned out that stratified and stratified restricted had the best security. Another set of architectural options is on how you choose paths through the network. Here, yep. here there's uh, a few different possibilities. Um, you could have a, a fully peer-to-peer -peer system where you lead, um, allow each node to choose where the traffic is going to go next, or you can have source routing. So source routing is normally a terrible idea because you can use it to bypass firewalls, but um, for an anonymous communication system, source routing is fairly common. For both Tor and Remailers, it is the client that chooses the path through the network, not the network itself. Um, this has um, some advantages for the implementation. It's a lot easier to do, um, have a centralised directory rather than a peer-to-peer -peer network, but it also improves security. So remember I mentioned that we should try to maintain as much security as possible when the network is compromised. So let's suppose that um, a proportion of the network's compromise we'll call N, the, and this is a, a, a proportion in terms of network resources. In a peer-to-peer -peer system, you have a one in N, um, or, uh, if N is the proportion um, to the power of negative one, you've got a one in N chance of choosing an evil node on your first hop. And then once you've chosen the evil node, if that evil node is then going to choose where you go to next, it will never send you to a good one. You'll be kept on this evil network. So you have a one in N chance of your um, connection being compromised. But now let's suppose that you're using something like Tor, where the client chooses the path, there's a one in N chance that your first node is compromised, but then you go into another node, and there's going to be still a one in N node, uh, one in N chance that your um, connection is compromised, and then you go into the third one, it will be the same. Because just because someone is compromised doesn't mean they can choose where you're going to go next. And it turns out in Tor, you have security provided there is at least um, there are, um, as long as your first node and your last node is secure, then you have security. And if the probability that each individual node is compromised is n, the probability that both your first hop and your last hop are compromised um, is going to be um, one is going to be n squared. So 
because n is less than 1, you have a much lower probability of being compromised when you're using something that's source routed than something that is peer-to-peer -peer routed. And that's why things like Tor are source routed. There are other options for building anonymity systems. Um, another one you might have heard of is Freenet. This is much smaller, but it makes some very different design decisions to Tor. With Freenet, you upload content onto the network. It then gets stored there, and you also store material that other people are uploading onto the network. And you can create websites, you can share content. Um, and when your computer goes down, the information that you're hosting becomes inaccessible, but that's OK because your information is going to be replicated across the network. Um, I tried to look for an interesting website to show you, uh, or Freenet, but I couldn't really find any because there are, isn't very much usage of it. Um, what I did find was instructions on um, how to fake fingerprints, and this is a, a fingerprint of one of the German ministers at the time. Um, but although you can get this in Freenet, you can also just get this off the web. Siphon's uh, another option. It made some different uh, design decisions. In particular, it wanted to be usable when you could not reconfigure your web browser. So in order to use Tor, you need to at least reconfigure your web browser, probably install another web browser, and run some extra software. That's fine if you own, this com own your own computer, but most internet users don't. Most internet users get access through internet cafes because they're in countries where the average person doesn't have the amount of money to spend on buying their own computer. Internet cafes obviously restrict what you can do on those computers. They also restrict how you can configure the web browser. So what Siphon does is you run a web server on a computer that's outside the country, or in practice one of your friends does. You connect to this over HTTPS, just type the address in here, and then you're shown a second address bar here. And then you type into this address bar where you want to go. And then the computer that your friend runs outside of the country um, downloads the content and rewrites all of these links so they link back onto the same website. And in this way, you can browse somewhat anonymously because your data is encrypted um, between you and the, your friend's computer, although it's not encrypted afterwards. And you also are going to show up in the web logs of the Internet Cafe as just accessing this web server. Um, but it doesn't give the same levels of properties, uh, same security properties that something like Tor does. So if you'd like any further information on this sort of information, um, there's a book called Access Denied, um, subsequent book um, called Access Controlled, which talks about the topics of internet censorship. Um, Security Engineering Second Edition, which is now available online for free, of Ross Anderson's uh, book, can tell you about um, anonymity systems. And if you're interested in some more research side of things, then a non-bib is the anonymity bibliography, and the, it highlights the particularly important topics in this field. Most of the research that I've been talking about is featured there. Um, and then there's the Tor Project website, um, if you want to know more about Tor. And happy to take questions now, um, and also I'll be around afterwards. Okay, thank you. Any questions? I've answered everything. to be able to set up cheap peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network mm -hmm. uh, in, in the same way as offering free Wi-Fi, but not relying on... on I don't know what this project was doing. Yeah, uh, so... Was building yeah. some, mm -hmm. some hacking, some very cheap hardware that you could use in some country. Yes, so there's a lot of interest in projects like that um, after the Egypt inc incident where um, in the, the final days of the revolution there, the um, 
Egyptian government just completely turned off the internet. Um, we saw the same thing happening in Syria. And there was a question of what to do in that case. Um, what some people did was um, airdrop satellite phones, um, but that doesn't really scale. So there was also a project from the New America Foundation um, called Internet in a Suitcase, where the idea is people would set up this peer-to-peer -peer network and they could communicate between themselves and um, they could also hopefully find their way to one of these satellite internet gateways in order to get information out of the country. So that was more good intentions than actual technology. When it was being talked about in the press, it didn't actually exist. It was an idea. Um, someone who was talking about it brought along a metal suitcase and he said it could fit in there. And generally in the media, um, message morphed into saying that this is the internet in a suitcase. So the technology doesn't really exist. It's very challenging to build. There is some research on mobile ad hoc networks that suggests how this can be done, but it has technical problems and security problems. So the technical problems is the range of these radios is fairly short, and if your population density is quite light, or actually just a normal population density, then you won't be able to get very far. You probably won't be able to get to one of these satellite gateways. Yes, yeah. So if you have something like um, a mobile phone, then you won't be able to do these sorts of things. So mobile phones can communicate over quite a long distance, but that's because mobile phone base stations are incredibly powerful. They've got very powerful transmitters and very sensitive receivers. They use a lot of energy for that. But when you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer network, you don't have this asymmetry to take advantage of. So the distance you can get realistically is much, much smaller. The other problem is security, and that comes back to the trade-off between peer-to-peer -peer and source routing. If you have a mobile ad hoc network, you don't know what the right path is between you and the satellite gateway, um, because you don't have a global view of the network. Nobody has a global view of the network. So you have to send your message on to someone else, and they have to try to work out how to get it on to the final destination. And this means that uh, if the network is compromised, as soon as you send it to someone evil, then you're completely compromised. And if the proportion of the networks compromised is n, then you're completely screwed um, with probability n. Whereas if you have a, a more centralized network where you have source routing, then it's only n squared if you're only compromised when two nodes are compromised and you're actually safe when one is compromised. Um, so I think no one has really been able to get something that is usable and secure for those sorts of circumstances. Um, what actually seemed to work in those countries was just doing foreign dial-up. So they would use an international phone call and then call up another country and connect to the internet over there. And that was, yeah. So you might only get, uh, I don't know, 28K, but uh, that's enough for getting some information out. Yeah, so to the question is about what happens if there's a malicious exit node. So the exit node is in the unique position that it can see the content that's being sent to this web server. Um, and unless the user is doing HTTPS end to end, it can also look at the content and it also can manipulate the content. And the correct solution to this is for Tor users to do encrypted traffic to the web server. And the way that this is tried to encourage is that Tor now ships with a web browser, and that web browser comes with a Firefox plugin called HTTP Everywhere. Uh, sorry, HTTPS Everywhere. So quite frequently you'll see websites where your initial login page is unencrypted, but the post request will go encrypted to protect your password, and then everything else is unencrypted. And this means that your password is protected, but the rest of the content is not, and that's not very good. Um, especially not very good if this um, Tor node run by a volunteer is being malicious and is either tampering 
on monitoring data. What HTTPS Everywhere does is when it sees an outgoing request to an HTTP web page, it checks whether this um, web page um, or whether this website actually supports HTTPS. It's got a long list. Um, sometimes the, it just it then enables HTTPS and other times it then um, changes the request um, to a different web server. So for example, if you use HTTPS everywhere and you do a normal request to Wikipedia, it will change the domain name rather than www.wikipedia to secure.wikipedia and then you'll now do an HTTPS request. So that does more encryption on this link and that protects against malicious exit nodes. Another thing that goes on is try to detect malicious exit nodes and if they're detected, they get removed from the network. Uh, there's a few mechanisms used for this. Uh, one is active scanning. So the Tor project makes a request to a known good web server and then goes through a large number of exit nodes and then sees if what comes back is expected. Most of the times it is. Sometimes it's not. Um, normally this is not for malicious reasons, normally this is because they've got some sort of firewall on here that rewrites links. Um, virus scanners quite frequently do that. Um, they Im get implemented as a firewall and they not only uh, intercept traffic that is generated on that host but also traffic that's being routed, routed through that host. Um, so sometimes we are able to fix those problems. If we can't contact the user to fix it, they just get blacklisted. Then there are also def definitely malicious material, uh, def definitely malicious things going on. So one is people who are looking at HTTPS traffic and then downgrading to HTTP. They get immediately blocked. Um, and also people who are advertising that they will route a strange set of ports. So like I mentioned, all these nodes are volunteers. If you're an exit node, and someone does something bad through your exit node, chances are the abuse complaint will come back to you. And that can be quite annoying. Um, there are some exit nodes who don't really care about abuse complaints. Um, they will just say that we're routing some other person's traffic and there's nothing we can do about it. But other people might work for, say, a university who really doesn't like abuse complaints. And what they can do in order to, to reduce complaints is only route s certain ports. So exit nodes have an exit policy and they say you can use me as an exit node but only if you're going to port 80 or 443. If you try to use email then I won't let you, you go through. And in fact the default exit policy bans email through Tor because there's um, too much potential for spam. But there are some exit nodes which only advertise ports which are used for plain text passwords. So typically we would see them advertising port 80 and port 143 for IMAP, maybe whatever the POP port is, POP3 port. And that's really suspicious. Um, that probably means that they're trying to collect passwords and in which case they get blocked. So the main lesson is use encryption. Doesn't matter whether you're using an internet cafe or using a wireless access point or using Tor, using end-to-end -end encryption is always, is always a good idea. But for some reasons, people don't use encryption, and then there's some things that can be done. Okay. Any more questions? Nope. Okay. I think lunch. Thanks.